while that comes up, I have to say thank you all very much. You've gotten very, very quick. Thank you, Tucker. Well, after the beatings last time, we start to learn. You know. If you don't beat me, I don't know you love me. Hey, hey. <laughs> we're, we're broadcasting. <laughs> Hold on a second. Um. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Office Hours. If this is the uh, first time you're here, let me give you a little quick introduction. Uh, you may notice that there are participants and then there are panelists. Uh, the big difference between the participants and the panelists is the panelists showed up early. They had good internet, they had good audio, they had good video. And so uh, what you need to do is get here before 6.40 uh, in the morning, and, um, and, then, and then you can, uh, you can jump in as a, uh, as a panelist. So um, you just want to make sure that you have strong audio, strong video, and a good internet connection. Uh, we open the doors at 6 a.m., uh, so that is uh, and pretty much within a minute of 6 a.m. So if you want to come early, you can. It's a much looser conversation uh, before 7 o'clock. Uh, 7 o'clock, we start really focusing on Q&A. And, uh, and, and going through that process. Um, but uh, if you get here at six, you can come hang out with us. And then at 6.30, we, dis we, we distribute a Discord link. Uh, Discord is uh, the online chat that we use to, to talk when we're not here. Um, and, uh, and that is another, uh, um, another about 400 people talking to each other about the same things we're talking about here. So you can get, you can get the Discord link. By the time I talk about it at seven, it's already uh, gone. So uh, it's, it's expired. So you need to get here at 6.30 to get the Discord link. And then at 6.40, we start doing uh, mic checks. Generally, we won't have you join after that. Uh, so if you haven't been here for mic checks, you won't be in the panel. Uh, remember that once you get into the panel, you can't ask questions. So uh, if you want to ask a question, go to Q&A and ask the question before you raise your Zoom hand. And that's how you enter the panel. You go, you get in early and then you raise your Zoom hand and then we'll bring you in. Um, the uh, Q&A is down at the bottom. You can ask questions there. Don't put comments there. So uh, the chat is for comments and for questions that you want to discuss with other people in the attendee area. Um, the uh, Q&A is the area where you only ask questions. Try to keep those questions short to four to six lines. Uh, if you write long ones, we'll probably just dismiss them. Um, if you're a panelist and you've just come in, don't touch the Q&A. <laughs> so it really makes it hard for Chris, uh, who is asking the questions. Uh, it makes it hard for him to keep track of what's going on. So, um, so make sure that uh, you uh, just, 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 uh, and and also if you're an attendee, uh, remember that you can vote, and I think you can vote actually as a as a panelist as well. If there are questions in the Q and A that you like, uh, vote them up because uh, Chris is going to be looking at the top ones uh, to make a decision about what we ask next. So. Definitely use the the thumbs up tool uh, to your uh, to your power, you know. So so anyway, so anyway, so do that. Um, the uh, um, we have a really you know some, something fun this after uh, the, at this afternoon. There's going to be a launch. We think is there still a launch? Do we know if it's been rained out or is it, is it, it looks like it's going through? So this is going to be the first uh, the first launch. Uh, of a commercial launch of a human into space uh, that wasn't done by a government agency. And so it does not that's appear to have been rained out yet. Okay, great. So, um, so that's always when with launches, you're always waiting to see what happens there. Uh, so what we did is we're, uh, we brought, we brought on um, some of the guys from Flightline to talk about exactly how they do it. They do a lot of this. And so we're going to talk about how you shoot a launch, not how you actually launch the rocket. That's a whole nother one hour. Um, but, but how you actually film the shooting of the rocket. And so they're going to be here in the second hour uh, at eight o'clock. So, um, so stay tuned for that. And then, um, we have this every every the, the second hour is always something more focused than Q and A, uh, and uh, we have tomorrow we're talking about wiring diagrams, why we use them, how we use them, what tools we use. It's, it's a discussion. I use my tools, you guys use your tools, and so we're going to kind of cross pollinate between uh, what those what those are. Uh, on Friday, Leland Best is going to talk about VMix. A lot of us uh, have been kind of circling it, thinking about it, um, looking at how cool it is. So Leland's going to kind of give us a real uh, uh, a quick dive into uh, into that process, and then. Um, I'm going to unpin this video. Hold on. There we go. Uh, my display just went crazy. There we go. Uh, and, um, and then on uh, Saturday, uh, we, um, we do two hours on Saturday and Sunday of Q&A. So seven to nine is, is two hours of what we're doing for an hour here, if you're new to it. Uh, and then Saturday, we have a long day. So nine o'clock, Nick Justice is going to be talking about Unreal. Uh, at 10 o'clock, uh, we have deep cuts from Steve Bays, the former senior product manager for Final Cut, deep cuts into Final Cut. And he's going to, he, he just shows us stuff that we've, that we've, uh, 
uh, never seen that. We didn't know we could do in Final Cut. And so he's going to be talking about that. I'm going to be talking about building graphics for live events. So yeah, last time I talked about countdown clocks, it was very exciting. Uh, and then uh, this week, I'm going to talk about super sources and how to build super source graphics and uh, prepare them for, uh, you know, for broadcast. And then uh, at noon, we had a lot of requests for network, uh, more network talks. So Aaron Mailer will be here and he'll be answering your questions about uh, about networks. And as a reminder that a lot of the stuff we're talking about in Discord, uh, Steve Bay is actually looking at the Final Cut uh, chart, uh, the Final Cut discussion. So it's literally the best place in the world to ask questions about uh, Final Cut. Uh, and then in the same thing, Aaron is and others are, and, and Aaron's very verbose. So if you ask questions in the networking area, uh, you'll really get a good answer. So um, and and then there's just tons of other discussions. I'm going to be doing some restructuring this weekend of it, and to make it even even better, I think. So uh, we keep, it keeps on getting deeper because people keep on making requests, and so it's turning into its own little world. Anyway. <clears throat> Time for questions. Uh, Chris, what do we got? Let's get into it. Uh, this seems to be a recurring theme in a lot of Zoom calls that I'm on, but people are loving Felipe's camera look, and they would love to have a breakdown, possibly an equipment list, of what Felipe does to look the way he does on camera. I think it might just be his face. Oh, my. Look at that. Oh look at God. that. Okay, Felipe. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> tell, us, tell us what... <laughs> Please pin <laughs> Felipe so we can all critique his shot. Okay, and all right. Break okay, it down. what do you, what do you got going on, Felipe? Well, I have a three point lighting. I have two key uh, Elgato key uh, key light airs. Uh, so I have. Uh, I'm gonna switch off my lights. So I have here on the side of uh, fill light, uh, which is in minimal. It's an aperture light, and then I have the uh, key light air from Elgato here, and a couple of. Um, uh, what's it called? Philips Hue in the background, just to pop a little bit the background because otherwise it's too dark. I can switch off the background, I think. <clears throat> yeah, this is the background with. Well, one of them is switched off. No, well. Well, no, I switched off. It turned off the one. blue well, whatever. one. Whatever. Like... Yeah, the other one is actually not a Philips Hue, the other one is actually a normal LED. So that's why I can control remotely. So that that's it. Now, and what's nothing the camera? much. And. It's a GH5 connected to the 8 Mini. The GH5 is on a 25mm f1.7. So that's why I get a little bit of uh, blurred background. Mm. Uh, just enough to, to separate me a little bit. And yeah. And since I don't have hair, you guys don't see the, 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 the hair light here. But yeah, it, it gives a little bit of separation. <laughs> that's great. So and and I think that <laughs> I think that it's important, uh, you know, when we we're going to we so one of the things to know is is for um, is that on uh, Mondays, if you're here on Mondays, we we do a uh, kind of a ruthless review. So at, we go through everybody, and we're gonna we're gonna focus more and more on your video and less and less on your audio. We discussed that a little bit um, uh, over the break because we're already doing audio checks every day. So we're really gonna talk about video. And uh, we're going to move through it really fast. We didn't move through it quite. The first time we did it was was a couple of days ago. We're, we're down to going to do it every week. So if you want your space, if you want your look to be reviewed, um, be careful. But everyone's going to review it, and uh, and so we're going to um, and and it basically you get about a minute, minute and a half of us kind of tearing apart your look. But there's not much to tear apart in Felipe Felipe's um, uh, look. So uh, so so he's a good example. But we have to. One of the reasons we do that is because it it's the future, you know, like, like us being able to pay attention to like how we look, if you're a salesperson, if you're trying to move something, if you're a manager trying to move things down the road, a lot of us don't take it seriously because we got used to doing all that, but it's a, it's a pretty important part of our job at this point um, is to look good. You used to figure out how you're going to dress when you showed up in meetings. Um, that time might be over. <laughs> it may never be coming back. So um, figuring out how you have a good rig and, 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 you know, so far we've all kind of started, um, you know, getting getting good at it, but uh, it's going to become more and more and more important as you as you move forward. So we're going to keep on trying to up our game as a group, and uh, that's part of it. So uh, next question. Next question. Oh, this just uh, what? Okay, these just changed. So, what is a non expensive backlight to highlight the top of your head? This is coming from our own Victor. An LED strip, I would say. Yeah, like it's yeah. Go, go ahead, Felipe. Yeah, I was going to say that this Elgato, 
Um, LEDs, they're nice because they are edge lit, so the, the, the light that comes out of it is very soft per nature. And uh, you can have them on your desk and they don't occupy a lot of space. They can control, be controlled over Wi-Fi. They are uh, by color from 7,000 Kelvin to 3,200. So can you, can you... I, I recommend them because they are like $120 per, per key light. Uh, George can Kennedy. You... So also Draycast is another option if you're looking for a budget-friendly light. So Drake, Drake class has got a whole lineup of lights that's pretty um, decently priced. Yep, and and uh, I'm I'm going to be testing some Nan lights soon, so we'll we'll take a look at those as well. They, I think they're pretty light and efficient, so we're going to take a look at those. Uh, Paul, yeah, uh, yeah. What are you using, Philippe, to control it? Or you have a little touchpad, or <clears throat> what have you got going on there? Yeah, so. Yeah, and, uh... Felipe oh, is from the we, future. We, we Felipe, you we just we, muted we got, yourself with your you're muted. Green deck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I clicked uh, and and muted myself. This I have my mute button here, and I have my lights button. I have Mimo Live, and a few other things going on there. So I can I have my heel lights on these ones, and down here I have my key lights. Chris and mute. Chris, <laughs> I think Chris is Chris is showing his light down there. Let's see here. Hold on. Um, where's Chris? Hold on. That's, it's is... one of the Aperture MCs. I got a couple of them. These things are pretty cool. Different one. Hold on. Chris so Sam. yeah, it's yeah. So we're 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 we, we we one of the discussions that we're starting to have here is that uh, um, that is forty two too many because <laughs> I can't. When someone says someone says someone has something, I can't find them anymore. So um, so anyway, so let's uh. Uh, let's go on to the, let's go on to the next question. Alex Golner is talking. This is something that I know that you've mentioned in the past, Alex. He says he has a friend that's planning a remote short film festival. What services and technologies would be good in order to both share the film, but then also have a Q and A between two to six people afterwards? Um. So what you want to do is you want to bring them in over some something point to point. You can use the you could use Zoom as something else, but you're going to pipe that into a switcher, and then you're going to play out the video. Uh, don't use any of the don't use any of the services to play out your movie. Um, you know that's that's a disaster. I mean, people have tried it, you know, and it's not it doesn't work. Um, so the reason is is that you're using low latency video to do high quality you know low low latency transport to do high quality video. And that's not what it's built for. It's built for us to interact. So interact on, on a platform. Now, what we do is we do single point for every person, you know, usually over Skype. Um, so we connect everybody and then we have, we cross point all of that in our studio. Um, but you can do that with a variety of different tools. There's, you know, there's also things like Skype TX boxes. We, we find that the, for us, the Skype TX box has too high of a latency. Uh, so it's good for connecting someone to a studio. We don't find it as good to connect to people to each other. Um, and so um, the, T, the TC1 seem to be at the same base latency of, of Skype, so they, they tend to work a little bit better. Um, and I also think that it's relatively good using, you know, vMix and, and uh, uh, Memo Live and um, oh, the, the last one, Livestream Studio, all have their own WebRTC solutions that you can use. So, uh, but then, then you want to play out. The, the the movie from whatever your system is that you're doing your edit so whether it's one of the, a software or an atem or whatever you play it out into uh the streaming service of your choice so then then it's just a matter of being uh, youtube or or uh facebook or whatever so i think that that is what um what i would recommend don't try to play it into a you want to use the thing but you're gonna have to find some way to do that to pipe out what you're seeing here as a screen and audio into something where you can have discussions um but then but then um, send the video and then you want people online to watch it. Uh, you can have that discussion between all the, the director and the DP and the, you know, the writers and stuff like that. But the question should probably come in from the online audience watching in whatever end CDN that you have. So that's, that's my recommendation um, you know, for that. I haven't seen anybody do it well otherwise. Yeah, Tucker. Just uh, know your latency on your CDN to, to know how long you need to pause, you know, how long you need to, to delay um, to make sure that, you know, the video has played out fully before you start Q and A or start talking to your audience. Well, you can you don't have to worry about it too much because your 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 audience is watching. Your primary audience will be watching on that CDN. So when you see it end, you just start talking because you're you're going to get the Q and A. You know you're going to be able to get questions. And the reality is is that 
um, there's, you know, different latencies that you can set. Like for instance, YouTube is like five seconds, 10 seconds or 20 seconds. It depends on how many viewers you have. If you have a lot of viewers, the human latency will get higher than the, than the stream. So it won't matter. Like right now we've got 16 questions. We're not going to get to all those questions in this hour. It didn't matter that we're at whatever delay we're at. Like right now you're seeing it in real time, but it doesn't matter because it's going to take me half an hour to get to that question. So, so you have to remember that there's human, I think a lot of people get really focused on, on uh, latency. And it just isn't that important once you have a certain number of people watching, you know, and so that's the thing to, to keep in mind as, as that, that, that low latency thing is, is great when you've got 20 people that you're trying to discuss things with, not useful when you get, um, you know, once you get over 200 people, it doesn't matter. Um, Chris? Just thinking this through, if I was a panelist on this short film, and I too was remote, then I guess we would all watch the film say on youtube or facebook wherever the no stream no you, is you can going. you can stream it to both at the same time so what you want to do is set up a system where you're able to push your video into the zoom and then into youtube at the same time so the panelists can see it the reality is the panelists don't really you know, they, they just get a preview the panelists it doesn't matter see it They're not, well no it doesn't matter they, they made it like they've seen it well already you know like so they they just need to know when it stops you know and so oliver go ahead yeah, so <clears throat> we've um, we can. I, I have some people doing this with Mimo Life, so um, mm -hmm. you can you can with six people is probably not a problem for the panelists, and then um, and you can now uh, select the return video to the callers, so you could just send them the best right. quality video. Yeah, no, that, and that would work as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Neil, did you did you have something to say there? Yeah, in terms of streaming to multiple sources, I've been having success with uh, StreamYard for that, mm -hmm. where I could stream to Facebook, YouTube. And with Facebook, you can choose specific groups. And as long as you're an admin of where you want to stream to, you can do multiple places at one time. Yep, StreamYard can do it, um, as well as uh, if, you, if you're geeky, you can use AWS and then also Restream.io. Um, so those are those are th three really strong ways to uh, to do that. Go ahead, uh, Chris. Next question. So last week, Alex, you mentioned a workflow where you can kind of force Zoom to share in full HD. Uh, you were doing something with a QuickTime movie, and Chris Barnett was wondering wondering if you could slow walk us through his phrase. I love it. <laughs> slow walk us through that process. Okay. I don't, so here's the thing is I will say that this is a hack. And I will also say that I don't know how long it will be required. I think that as Zoom builds up its infrastructure, I'm not sure uh, that we will need to do this. But in the moment, the issue that I have is I want to do training and I, I have a switcher, you know, so I'm, I've got a bunch of cameras. I've got, um, you know, I've got a telestrator so that I can, you know, draw and stuff like this. And, and so I want to be able to use all of those things while I'm training. And the problem I had is if I do screen capture, if I do screen share, I can't do that. So what I, the, the problem, and then, but the, why do I want to use screen share? Because in Zoom, you have a choice between video or screen share. When you do video, it prioritizes frame rate. When you do screen share, it prioritizes uh, your resolution and, but you're using the same amount of data. So, so it will say, oh, I'm going to make sure that you get great r resolution and I'm willing to throw away your, um, your frame rate, uh, for if you're, if you're doing it. So I wanted to do both. Well, I, 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 I right, more than that, I want to be able to use my switcher as a video input. Um, but I want to get that resolution. So what I did to do that, and I can't, it's really hard to do because you're, it's kind of like folding in on yourself. So I'm just gonna have to explain it. But what I do is I, I set my switcher, I set the, I, I open up QuickTime and QuickTime, you have a choice of, you know, uh, record new movie, record new audio, record screen. And um, what you want to do is you, you essentially, uh, what you want to, um, to do there is you set for the input of QuickTime, you just set it as I want to look at the web presenter. That's what I'm using to get in. So look at the web presenter in QuickTime. When it does that, now my switcher is going into QuickTime. And QuickTime is nice. The reason I use QuickTime is because it, if you don't touch it, it becomes a clean aperture. There's no interface, right, to QuickTime. So now you have this window that's just getting whatever's sent coming into your into your web presenter. So it's just a nice clean window. So then you go into uh, Zoom and you say screen share, and then it lets you pick what app you want to screen share, and you screen share your QuickTime, which is getting that that from your from your switcher. 
there are some side effects. One is is that the sync may be a little off um, on the video, and and I'll be and when I talk, it'll be lower frame rate. But it means that if I'm teaching you something, I can cut back and forth. I can do all the other stuff that I want to do. I can cut between sources. I can do telestration. I can do all the things. I have a whiteboard. So I have all the other things that I have. Um, and I decided that the lower frame rate for me didn't matter as much. You can still hear what I'm saying. You can kind of see me when you need to. So um, so that is a slower version of, of how to do that. But you're basically just setting your input, your video is coming into QuickTime, and then you're screen sharing QuickTime. And that's all that. That's how that's how I'm doing it. Um, Chris, next question. Did anyone watch the Memorial Day concert this weekend on PBS in the States? What did you think of the mix of the live remote feeds and recorded media into performances and the general show flow? I've heard of this thing called TV. I did. It was really popular in the last century and maybe in the last decade. And I, I haven't, I literally have not watched. I don't know why. I think there was something about a whole bunch of these, these shows were so bad. They were so boring that I just stopped watching them. So I, I don't even, they're not even coming up for me as a thing to do. Um, PBS's app isn't very, like, I don't know why I don't, I haven't, I, for some reason when I cut the cord, I really stopped watching PBS because it just doesn't, the online, its online presence isn't very good in my opinion. And so I just don't, it, it just stopped existing for me, I think. <laughs> so I, I, I occasionally search for Frontline, um, but that's that's about that's about it. Um, other Other people, did anyone else see it? Yeah, go ahead, George. Um, I saw a little bit of it. Um, again, wasn't impressed. Um, if anyone want to look at Frame IO's blog right now, they have a little write up on the Lady Gaga, how they put that together. But I, I, I honestly, I don't think it's working. And it's just terrible that PBS will do the same thing over again after someone else failed at it. So it's kind of ridiculous at the moment. <laughs> so you we're, were rough, we're a rough crowd. We're we're a rough crowd. <laughs> When it comes to that stuff, I mean, I, I think that the, the 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 big issue is that television producers actually don't really understand live. You know, it terrifies them. They don't. You very rarely see anything live. Um, you know, so when you think it, you see sports, but sports are a highly structured thing. We know exactly where the cameras are going to be. We have a known known location that we're covering, and you know, it's and it's a system that has generally, if you're watching on TV, there's a lot of money behind it, and there's a big crew, and it's a very controlled environment, but creating content and the content creates itself right the, the big the big thing about live sports is that there's a game like you don't have to write everything for it you know and you don't have to figure it out people are just kind of riffing a lot of the time and there's still a ton and ton a ton of work um to make that work but and it's it's but it's highly structured when it comes to actually doing show shows um where you have to go from one thing to the next this is not something you see very often most of what you see is on it, like all the, the late night stuff is all, you know, of course done three or four or five hours before the, you actually watch it. The, the nightly news, you know, is done a half an hour to an hour before the, it finishes a half an hour, an hour before you see it. So they don't do, the only time you really see like non-sports live content is like red carpets, which are usually a, uh, you know, a boiling mess, you know, <laughs> generally uh, red carpets are not, not super successful. Um, the, uh, you see, um, uh, I'm gonna let Rob in here because he may have some some things to say. Um, the uh, uh, but you don't see it very very often. You don't see live very often because it's uncontrolled, you know. And and so what we don't see very often is people. Um, I don't see. We just keep on seeing this thing where it's all pre-recorded all the time. You know, all these like I'm gonna do a concert and then I'm gonna go to someone's house and then I'm gonna do this thing, and you could make it live and people would watch that. People would be really excited about seeing that live and it might not be perfect and people are okay with that, but it's really hard for, um, for, I think for most television producers that are doing this stuff to, uh, to, to go down that path, you know, and, and it's hard to sell it. It's hard to, you know, that there's that whole, you know, one step ahead, you're a leader, two steps ahead, you're a martyr, you know, you're putting, you know, saying we're going to do a bunch of re-records is a safe thing to say if you're if you're talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of, of investment saying you're gonna go live to 20 locations live is not you know not something and we do it all the time you know we were fortunate enough that you know google spent a lot of time and money with 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 my my last company to have us do this all over the world where everybody was live all the time and then it was also then on youtube so it was permanent so we couldn't you know we had to get it right you know and so we have a really good ground game when it comes to preparing people for live. And it doesn't mean that it's perfect. And there's all kinds of things that happen. Um, but, uh, but it is, you know, we've gotten to a pretty high level of, of success because of just a lot of practice. 
Um, and, and I don't think that, I think we, you know, some of us doing online, whether it's Leo doing Twit and some of us doing some other things like that, probably have way more practice doing it live, live, like real live, like a couple seconds, you know, a couple seconds of delay live um, than most broadcasters. You know, I don't see, you know, and news, you know, you have to remember that news and sports are largely disposable content. You'll never see it again. You know, like once it's done, no one's going to, I mean, other than the highlights, no one's ever going to watch a football game again. I mean, very rarely. It's not really. I mean, you can watch the highlights, but I'm a big Steeler fan. I don't go back and watch old games. You know, like, you know, like that's, yeah, go ahead, Scott. I, I would have agreed with you until I saw the results of the English Premiership on NBC. And they almost have as many people watching the recorded matches afterwards. But there's reality that only all the matches are on at the same time. So if you want to actually see what happened, you have to go back and rewatch. And the highlights just don't cut it. But, they're, but they're within... Too- but a week later, crazy. It, but it's a week, the only place but, but a week later, does anyone does any? I mean, like a week after the the game, it, does, it, it shrinks fairly quickly within four yeah. days. But the the amount of take yeah. of their video on demand of their, yeah. their full matches. Oh I've yeah, no, but, like, but 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 still, no. uh, what I'm saying is, is it's not permanent. Like we're gonna watch it forever. Like we're gonna go back to it. It's 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 like oh we did it, and then within a week we never think about it again. The next one comes in, and and we moved on. You know, and with news. Yeah. Any, you know, news is live, but oh, we did it, and then that was a mistake. Like we lost some signal, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, like you know, like we just we're just gonna move on. Okay, well now we're gonna cut to something else. Go ahead, Chris. Um, I've been thinking that what the sports people should do, since they don't have any games to broadcast, is get a panel of say like six or eight great basketball players that play today and watch old. Ga- you said nobody wants to watch an old game watch an old game like like a landmark <clears throat> game and let them yeah. discuss it pause it and we, since it's live bring in questions. we did some tests we did some tests for basketball that um mind-numbing like like it was it was so exciting to watch we had old we had former player not old players former players from a basketball team and we gave them we gave them this overhead shot that you can't that you never see because i was looking up at the rafters we did a lidar of one of the uh, basketball locations you uh, one of the arenas yeah. and um so I could see everything. I could see all their rigging. I could see everything, you know, at my house. You know, I just rotated around and look at it. And and I said, hey, can I put a camera up on that? On, and they said, oh, you, you won't get a good shot of the, of the, you know, you can't get a good shot up there. And I'm like, I think I can. And we put up the camera and, and it just worked perfectly. Like you get this almost overhead shot. It's almost perfectly overhead of the court. And then what we did is we gave the, the basketball player um, a, a telestrator. And this is just a test. It wasn't in one of our broadcasts, but a telestrator and had them explain this the tactics like what is actually happening when you're watching it and it was it just i, I completely it changed basketball for me overnight because he said see what they're doing here they're doing this block and he's blocking him and he's going to run this way and he, and he you know start doing the john madden thing of like when they and they never tell you this in basketball like, like you because you never have that angle you never have you that overhead have angle where you can explain in basketball it. it's such a yeah you don't have the time game. i mean that's why i think that's why football is so big in a lot of ways is because of all that is because we can create context in football you know and um american football anyway but but being able to stop and look at look at something and how it worked and being able to talk about it and draw the little like this is what they're actually doing and why they're doing it with what you know is fascinating. So I think you're right yeah. that if commentary on older producer, games. Would be really I'd cool. be pushing for this like yeah. hardcore. Well, when we yeah, talk to someone, you we talk to someone at NASCAR, you know, like I, who's you know, I we had to do some racing stuff and. I didn't know anything about it other than put tra- put really good transmitters on to fast cars, you know, and and that was a um, uh, but understanding a lot about NASCAR. Suddenly I was like, there's a lot more going on there. Now, when I watch it, it, it pays more attention. But you're right. You could fill all this content. I would much rather watch. I would be much more likely to watch old games being reviewed and really dug into and commentated on um, than watching some kind of this real time game stuff on that they're pro- broadcasting, which I don't find particularly compelling. And think about it. It'd be really fun to see like six rivals around a yep. telestrator, a big giant, yep. you know, yeah. table. Let's think about that. Anyway, so yeah. if you guys see the show coming out in the next two weeks or three weeks, it started here. You've There's heard a bunch of people like, Alex, hmm. Alex, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. You got to jump in really fast because I was about okay, to change the subject. Follow them. Just the question is follow the money. When you're working for a corporation, i.e., the advertiser, that is wanting to be very safe because they don't want to be sued. And so consequently right. the, the follow the money is your question, Chris. Yep, yep. And, and, and the, and the, 
The other answer is, is that this is what like Google and Facebook should be putting money into just doing live events that are like throw money at it, yes. which they have in the past. I've been the recipient. So, um, so they, you know, there's money there to be thrown and they should, I don't know if they should throw it at me, but they should be thrown into doing events that rethink, reshape how people think of live and it rather would be more than of a game. Waiting. It would be a live game yeah. experience concept. Yep. Okay, next next question, Chris. Philip Oler says, uh, in a nutshell, Vimeo live stream studio, talk amongst yourselves. Uh, what do you think of it? I think it's, it's pretty good. Uh, we've used it for some events. Um, it is, it's really a resource hog to do everything that you want it to do. Uh, and when you bring remote participants in, it drives me a little crazy that they all have to have, there's like a single link. And if you have to reset it, you have to reset it for everybody, which was, I was like, I'm never using this again. <laughs> like, like, you know, like it was, it was one of those things like, it was like, oh, this is a great idea. Let's do all the stuff. And then when I had to reset the link for everybody, I was like, yeah, no, 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 thank you. So, uh, so it died really quickly for me from, from just because I couldn't build individual join links um, was kind of the uh, end for me. Um, but it has, you know, a good feature. It's it has a remote control system where you can log in. Someone can just give you a link, and you can log in and control it. Except it fell apart when we actually tried to use it. Um, and uh, yeah, so there was a lot of things. That it, I guess my experience was there was a whole. It was typical. Like there was a lot of features there that, and you know, half cooked. No, that was kind of my my uh, my two cents. And I know I know I just ruined the experience for everybody else. Like if anyone else, anything, does anyone have any positive things about it? It's a good idea. It's just not, I just don't think it's done yet. Anyway, um, next question. Uh, next question. Tony Tang is, <laughs> he's got an interesting idea. First of all, he wanted some recommendations on uninterruptible power supplies, especially for home use. But then is anybody using a Tesla power wall and does it do a safe switch over uh, as like the ultimate UPS for your whole home? We've how, many, talked how, about many, getting... how many power walls do you have, Alex? I'm working on it. I, I, I'm actually planning to get it before the fire season. I have a lot of solar, so I have I can run my house pretty much on solar. And so um, at, during the day and so not having the power wall became a big issue when I lost power last year. So I'm planning to get some later this summer. Um, but does so. it work as an uninterruptible power? Not uh, uninterruptible. Yeah. It, it will do a switch, but not UPS. Can't clean. you just power your house through it and then trickle charge it? I don't think you can trickle charge it. I think it's a non off thing. Okay. I, I may be wrong on that, but I, I thought, I thought that you can, you can, you can, you can set it. So it's the primary power source and then you're constantly pushing into it. Um, but I, maybe I, a I new feature. I, I'm, I don't know. Yeah. So I have to, that, I'm still researching it cause I'm planning to get one, but yeah, Chris, and then, and then you shy. Alex, when you say you can power your house with the, uh, with the, um, Tesla stuff, do you, is that with or without AC? <laughs> no, I, I'm saying I don't. I, I don't know if I can power the whole thing right now uh, with the Tesla with the Tesla ones. I think I probably need two uh, with AC. Um, but I, I have enough solar to with AC to to power my house. Um, it's most of most of the roof is is solar. So most of the roof and my garage roof is solar. So it's um, I don't really. I have to pay some kind of weird connection to PG&E, but but outside of that, I don't. Don't Seems to me soldiers. I've seen a, a shot of your roof on a TikTok video. <laughs> if you go to TikTok in the McDubbies, you'll see the shot of my roof um, and my pool. Uh, my son falls through. My son falls from the sky into, and he just barely misses the pool. And so that's that's the uh, that's the house. Um, you shine. Okay, uh, the Tesla battery is genius. I think it's a really good implemented solution. Uh, regarding how much you can load on it, it have to do with the KVM, which is how many battery you can daisy mm -hmm. chain to each other. Now the switching, it's a separate switch. It's basically called ATS switch, which is pretty expensive, but that does seamless transition. So, but it's an additional component that you need to add. It's an ATS switch, basically. That's, that's and, the- And to go back, and, and for home UPS to just back up to just our equipment and not backing up the whole home, uh, you know, APS makes really good, you know, APS uh, makes really, that's all we've used or most APC? Of we've used cyberware. APC? APC, APC, I'm sorry, not APS. APC, and that's you want to look APC. for the smart, the smart UPS line, which is the home line. Yeah. Uh, you'll, you'll get about, what, 900, well, is it? I'm not I sure have a 900 what, watt. The Rangers. Yeah, nine, it, that's, the, that's the standard size. It, it's about a foot, foot and a half deep by six inches wide or something. I just yeah, left I, a link for APC's guide to using UPCs. So go check that link. It should give yeah, you a yeah, full fledged. Tucker, Tucker, and then we're gonna move on. Uh, yeah, in uh, 
like mission critical networking, we do uh, 48 or you're tapping. Are we good? Oh, yeah, go, okay. go ahead. You're, you're a little crunchy today. Um, I'm, we're not sure what happened. You're, interesting. You're, I'll uh, have to take a look. Yeah, anyway, yeah, uh, anyway go ahead. But, you're left, you're uh, in, left only right now. Oh, okay, gotcha. I'll fix that. Um, the So, sorry, let me get my brain back. Um, in like telco and high networking, uh, we'll do like 48 or 56 volt battery banks that are constant charge. Uh, and then everything that runs off of those switches, servers, anything, um, most of those have an option for uh, 48 volt uh, or 24 volt uh, power rails that you can feed them directly. So if you had a mission critical system, um, if you wanted to take a specific, like all your black magic stuff and things like that, you could pick, you know, and make all those things run off DC, run through a battery bank like that and have true full battery all the time. Yeah, and there's some there's some UPSs that are that are really passing you data, power through the batteries, and we use them in our broadcast truck, where in our little trailer because it just meant that it was truly cleaning the signal, as well yeah. as if you lost power, it wasn't switching over. It was just it, you were just you were just work you were always working off the battery, yeah, and that, the those are the best key. ones. They're a lot more expensive. Um, yeah, the key is yeah, in, okay. yeah, in an enterprise. Okay. We're gonna go. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna keep moving. Uh, next question. Okay. Next question. Uh, Dave Burke says, Alex, you mentioned a while back companies making big investments in video quality for executives after COVID. Can you share any details or news coverage of this? Nope. This is just your own speculation? It's not my speculation, but I can't share anymore. I can just tell you that there are thousands, thousands of, of units per, per company are being are being bought right now. And the... I can tell you that the number, the, the price that they're spending is between four and 6,000 <laughs> per, per person. So, so, you know, so that I, I can't get into the details of who's doing that or how they're doing it, but they're all doing it. <laughs> you know, like they're all, I mean, it's some number, it's, it's some number between the hundred or 200 of them to thousands. Um, so, but, but I, you know, I know the people who are servicing them, you know, who are fulfilling the orders and they're not me. Um, but, uh, Unfortunately, because <laughs> it's it's a lot of money, uh, but they're they're definitely um, getting orders for in the in the magnitude of thousands of orders, you know, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand units at a time. So you know, there there's a lot, and so and it's something for us to realize is that a year from now, everyone's gonna you know look. I mean, everyone who's making decisions or in, or that is considered in front of a lot of people are gonna have really good video, and so we just want to keep on thinking about that as we and it's gonna be a competitive landscape to get jobs and everything else and so it is when you're thinking about what to invest in or where to go and what what that looks like you know you just want to think about the fact that your video setup is probably more important for your employment than your car <laughs> so so um you know so it's just something to kind of consider dan um and also consider that those folks are going to need help getting those systems set up so the more they cost often the more complex they might be and so that may well be where you guys fit in Yes, uh, Sky. What, well, I'm, also gonna, I'm just going to throw in the, the soft skills of the performance of the conversation of the, yep, the performance. That's, yeah, I mean, that's, just, that's where I'm stepping in as as producing. You and, can throw a lot of that technology in there, but understanding how you're going to interact with people and understanding what you're going to do, and and as I I went on a little tirade on Twitter, um, you should not use PowerPoint more than you have to. Like, and, and, uh, you know, it should, it should support what you're saying. And I, I, I think that I, I, I flat out just said on Twitter, I was like, if you're reading off of your slide, you're doing it wrong. Period. I, Period. I, like Red, there's not, there's no, there is no time that that's right. Red, ever. Redmond, Redmond pays a lot oh, of my mortgage. I, it's a, I just say, yeah. I know, pay. I know, I know. So anyway, uh, go, go ahead. Uh, next, next question. What's the best color temperature for my first video lights? Alan Scott. Gem. Buy like. color lights. Just get by color, color light. I mean, the, nowadays, if I'm going to buy a light, it's going to be by color. I need choice. That's what I would do. Get uh, 3,000 to 6,000 Kelvin as a range minimum. Yep. I would get by color. Um, if you're going to, if you had to choose between 32 and 56, I would get 56 because a lot of times you're trying to deal with outside lights and windows and everything else. And so once you go, once you commit to 32 outside of a studio, you are now committing to a world of unhappiness. So, 30, yeah. you know, so it's, so if, if you have to choose between one or the other, I'd say 56, but otherwise by, I would agree that by color, the and, only issue with by yeah. color is in the middle, you know, in the outer edges, you just remember that you're not getting constant light. Yep. In, in across that range. So it's actually darker on the two ends than in the middle because it's using 
you know, you, you have two sets of lights that are getting turned on to, to even it out. So you just have to know that you're not in a con it's not a constant straight along yeah, curve. It can be, of your... you can wire those up so that you have, I know I'm saying it well, when you yeah. buy them, WM. when you buy yeah. them, that's not the way they work. <laughs> so, Some people, so that yeah, well, when you're calling, <laughs> Um, no, you, you can make them that way, but you can't buy them. I mean, you can buy them. There's some that will do that, but the vast majority that you buy will be brighter in the center than they are on the ends. Uh, Jeffrey? You can also get color gels. You can. I'm just, it, it but but it is it is easier. It, it will be easier, like definitely prioritize by, um, I would prioritize by color, then I would go to 56 and think that I'm going to use, you know, get a C CTO to put over it if I need to. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, but bicolor is, is probably the best answer if you, if you and, can. Go ahead. and there's enough bicolor units out there that are inexpensive that are now. Yeah. I mean, at this point we're kind of led 3.0. So. Yeah. You, yeah. you can just yeah. buy a reel that I was like, I was holding up there, uh, for 12 bucks for yeah, 24 but feet, you know, time, you can, time, you can I know, but time, 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 time versus as long as, as long as you've got a, uh, uh, some kind of diffuser cloth or whatever in front of it, you'll be fine. Uh, Je Neil. Yeah, if you're going to go with actual filters in front of the light, not like diffusion, but actually a filter, make sure that it was designed for LED lights. Roscoe and Lee and Apollo all have specific gels for LED lights to deal with that spectrum. Great. Uh, next, next question. A hotel manager friend of mine, this is from Ray Franklin, asked what connectivity Chris, you're breaking up. Okay, okay, you're back. You're back. Really? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. do it again. Next question. Okay. A hotel manager friend of mine asked what connectivity specs should his property have to draw, I love this, an Alex Lindsay event that needs to be sent out to the outside world. 100 megs up. 100 megs? That's what, 100 megs. I mean, that's, that, that is, you know, that's where you want to start. You know, I mean, obviously, when we see, when we see locations that say that they've got 500 up or a gig, we definitely prioritize them, but we, you know, and, and so the bare minimum that we want to see is 20, like 10 is like, Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, especially for a facility. Like you just go, well, there's not much we can do there. 20 is like, Oh, we might be able to get something done, but a hundred is, you know, hundred is not that hard to get these days for most commercial facilities. And that's going to be the starting point for, you know, I wouldn't, if, and we are considering, or I am considering starting to build like these recommendation lists in different cities of these are the best locations to do an online event, because I think that that's missing, you know, is, is to start, you know, you know, building something up where people can refer to this is a good facility to go to for online events, because a lot of them are not, you know, and, and so uh, in, in the places where you have access to fiber and so on and so forth. I mean, I would put a gig in. I mean, the survival of these facilities is going to be bandwidth, you know, and 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 being able to project and do stuff and everything else. And if they don't uh, figure that out, the ones that don't figure it out will not are not going to survive the next two years. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. You you should make that list public to shame these places into getting better bandwidth. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the plan is to put it up. I'm, I'm talking about an internal list. I'm talking about an external list of like, these right. are the ones that we've, you know, like, like, for instance, when we go to hotels, if I'm given a choice, I will always go to the Four Seasons, not because it's a nice hotel, but because their IT staff is really good, you know, and so the Four Seasons will, they'll, they'll slice me off of VLAN, of VLAN. they'll give me port, you know, the port access, you know, you have one conversation with them, there's not 100 conversations, the other good ones are like the Aria and the Win in Vegas, I know it, I'll get exactly what I'm asking for, you know, and, and, it, and, and, and they've got almost unlimited amount of bandwidth. It feels like, I think they got 10 gig pipes, you know, going into those, into the, uh, just for the events, you know? And so, um, the, so there's, there's certain hotels, Mandarin, uh, hotels are, 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 are really good, you know? So there's different hotels that you, you start pushing your clients towards and, and, and I'm, and it used to be something that as a streaming company, we were like, Oh, we're going to have to go to this company. You know, we're going to have to go to the Marriott, <laughs> which is <laughs> traditionally bad. Um, and uh, the, you know, and, and all these little facilities who don't, who didn't prioritize it and you just kind of put up with it and you tell clients like, why did we do this? Like, why did we go to this location when you were going to stream and the streaming was the most important part? You should be prioritizing. Now they're all going to prioritize it. So it's super important for facilities to upgrade. That's probably the number one thing they could do in the downtime is put in a one, I would put in a one gig connection. I wouldn't go any lower than that, but I would consider a hundred megs is the minimum. Like I would, I will be actively recommending against think, uh, you know, a facility that can't give me protected hundred megs, 
um, you know, is, is going to be, some, you know, so protected 100 megs, not 100 megs. I think Chris was kind of going down that path, but not just that it has it, but that they actually have the ability to slice off VLANs and everything else um, so that I know that I can, uh, that I'm going to have the data that I need. Yashai? And then Richard? I'll go, I'll go even further than that. I think they should have redundant two, two providers as opposed to one. If somebody's going to take it serious and they're going to bring huge events that have a lot of money, I'll take two separate providers that have two separate line coming into the facility. And there's and there's a and they should be putting that front and center. You're absolutely right. And they should be yeah. putting it two separate vendors and talk about the fact, you know, like absolutely. facilities that start talking about the fact that that we've got um, we're providing redundant, um, you know, you know, being able to promote that we're providing, you know, completely redundant, well managed connectivity as we get out of quarantine and go into social distancing. All of these facilities are amazing for that because they're big. You can keep everybody separate. They're great stages for for streaming. Um, but if they don't have the bandwidth, it's not going to matter. You know, like and the ones that are that are putting money into that are going to, you know, benefit in the short term and maybe benefit in the long term uh, because of it. I know big convention centers like uh, Moscone is definitely um, spending a lot of effort letting everyone know that, oh, by the way, we have all the bandwidth in the world and we've got lots of space. And so Moscone is the big convention center here in San Francisco. And, uh, so that, that's a, they're, they're promoting that. And I think that a, a lot of them are going to have to promote the fact that they can, that they can do that. Uh, Richard, you had one last thing and then we'll move on. Yeah, just to echo everything that's been said, except for I run a venue in Belfast and we're quite a small venue and um, we made sure that we got a gig line into the building, but we only have to, at the, our stage of growth, only use 100 megs up right now, but we know that we can expand that. And already, even before COVID, we were able, the, the BBC was able to come in, a lot of other businesses were able to come in and use that and it was a big selling point. So it, yeah, it's incredibly important. That's great. Now I want to, now I want to do a show out of Richard's facility because he's got good bandwidth. Please do. But, there, you know, I, and, and so I think that there's a, um, anyway, there's, there's a bunch of stuff there to, to figure out, but I think that there's a future for a web page that is just um, highlighting the ones that are there, like not saying that they're not there, but just saying these are the ones that are certified that we know, know can do that. Um, About anyway, a next, decade next, ago, uh, I ran a site that was since bought by Condé Nast, where we did a quarterly hotel Wi-Fi report. This is more for resident not residential access but room access but the same thing applies here what we ended up doing was submitting a survey and we were getting active responses from every every hotel uh, like the, the third the third quarter after we started doing this because it's huge marketing like you said uh it's a it's you could become the net craft of of uh venue wi-fi well and the, the funny thing about venue wi-fi is access i actually as one as a business traveler i always want my wi-fi to be expensive because it means less people will be using it so i'm always like I, if, if, I, if i see it for free i go i know i'm not gonna be able to get anything i was like i want 20 meg 20 dollars a day you know like you know just make it 20 bucks a day because because that means that you know there'll be like eight of us on it rather than you know 100 people on it so anyway I'm not chris sure if they're still doing this report but if you're interested check out uh, uh cn traveler and they might still be doing doing that report quarterly. It's neat stuff. That's great. Orin uh, Shamran says, on lighting, uh, dialing in the C920, that's the webcam everybody likes, exposure is a real challenge. I, I would agree. Any tips on how to balance between a key light and natural window sunlight without blowing out or getting muddy? Block tips the sunlight. on making it look the best. Block the sunlight. <laughs> and use the dual color lights that Jem recommended. Do, do whatever. Yeah, here's the deal: sunlight is the devil. You know, like unless you unless it's unless you live in Seattle, um, you know, sunlight. Like when you're trying to do something, sunlight's nice and soft in Seattle all the time. So, uh, or most of the time. But but for the most part, the problem if you're trying to do anything professionally is that the sun is not predictable. You know, you've got clouds, you've got soft, you've got hard, you've got um, skylights, you've got all these other things. It's why you go into a studio and you block it all out. You know, it's, it's part of why my little tent is around me is not just for the sound, it's so that it blocks out all the windows and everything else that, that are here because I want to I want to have it be the way I want to have it. I don't want to have it be the way it is today. And so, um, if you want a consistent area, you block the sun, you block the light out. Well, like, and that's what the, that's know. what the clouds do. That's what the Seattle issue is because we're between two mountain ranges, so we get those constant softbox yeah. clouds. But but the main thing is is that if you're going to do it consistently and you're built, you're setting up your system, you know the 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 sun is not in in this case the sun is not your friend, Chris, and then and then and then Leland, and then we'll move on. Uh, yeah, the uh, after our um, what what do you call it? The uh, analysis the, on Monday the, with our. Yep setups i put a cheap sheet over my you know camera yep. left shoulder 
and that took care of that hot spot that people were telling me about. Yep. And then I cleaned up my background. But I like my gray Reed Richards kind of like side light mm -hmm. from the windows, but that's not the direct light anyway. So. Yep. Yep. No, absolutely. And uh, Leland, last one. Yeah, and just you touched upon the fact that, you know, the white light we see normally is a rainbow of, of light color, obviously, and black is no light. It's always best to start your production setup with absolutely no light or black and work the lights in yep. there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next question. I think we saw that when Felipe turned all his lights off. Um, if buying a lens uh, for a black magic pocket cinema camera, I think that's what all those letters are, 4K, used with an ATEM and Zoom, what would your choice be? Prime, Zoom, Metabones could be used as well. Where um, would you start to get all the functionality you always talk about, like being able to focus? So there's there's functionality and then there's quality of glass. And they they right now they don't they don't necessarily match one to one. So um, I'm using a these are Lumix Lumix I their I S I iOS lenses. Um, for my overhead cameras and the reason is is that i can control zoom you know through the camera i mean through the switcher so uh so those powered lenses will let you um zoom in and out um now now go ahead sky what which one is that that's the sigma 18 uh to 34 uh art lens it's but, got a, a down to 1.2 so i get that nice uh right. depth of field issue and it's it is the zoom so I, but, but it's not a motorized zoom. You can't, you can't no, control the zoom from, no, uh, from the it's switcher. A, it's, yeah. it's a manual, but I do have, of course, the meta bones to get me onto the GH. I mean, to the, the, uh, the four, four K. Right. Yeah. So, and, and, uh, for ease of use, most of my fourth, my micro four thirds stuff is all micro four thirds lenses. I just like to just pop them on and, and not have to think about it. Um, the, uh, but I'm, mine is a six K. So I'm using EF lenses and my kind of walk around cameras where my general camera is a 16 to 35. I also have 24 to 70, 70 to 100, you know, and then I've got a 50 and an 85, you know, kind of like those are the kind of very standard groups of lenses. Uh, and then I have some wide angle ones. But um, anyway, how do, I, how do you feel I, about fix, fixed lenses? The primes? Well, yeah. I mean, I mean uh, yes. I mean, how do you? <laughs> when, when we do interviews, when we do interviews, it's all primes. You know, like we, we, we want to choose what we, you know, like when we're doing a really, really good interview and we want the best glass, generally we're going to use a prime uh, or a really expensive zoom. Um, you know, but any manufacturer, uh, for, any manufacturer that you like other better than other, Canon, other than, I mean, Zeiss obviously. Oh, for the lenses, yeah, uh, as you know, <laughs> yeah, like I mean, that's like you know, like I mean, if you're gonna ask me, like, what are my choices? If someone says, what do you want? Yeah, there's 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 good lenses out there. They're seventy thousand dollars each. You know, like you know, so I rent them. You know, when you get when you need a really really good lens, you just rent the lenses. You know, you don't, you know, for our for our Ursas, we use we use a lot of the Fujinon. Um, Cabrillo lenses. So those are anywhere from 13 to 30 grand each. Um, but they're motorized zoom lenses that we can put on telemetrics and control them. Um, and so, you know, I so think you, you can, see you that lens. Crazy. I think that's what guy's shooting, shooting me with right now. I'm just using the Fujinon 18 to 55. It's not motorized, but I have used uh, motors on it. You can get yeah. um, a couple different ones from Crozier right. and whatnot and then control them. But that's not what I'm using here. I'm using really relatively inexpensive lenses. We're, we're going crazy. We're talking about crazy lenses right now. Um, but you can, uh, uh, you know, the, the Zeiss stuff is really good. The, the Zuko, you know, there's some Zuko Micro Four Thirds lenses that are really good. Um, and so uh, you just have to really think about that. And, and again, on a day-to-day -day basis, on, what I will say is on a day-to-day -day basis, I generally use um, zoom lenses because they're just easier to work with. You know, I can get what I want. I'm not moving things around. Um, I, you know, if I don't have time to set it up, I'd much rather have a zoom lens than a, than a prime just because I don't, Pamela, don't have that kind of time. Sigma, do you care? Most of my lenses are, are, are Canon L series. I mean, that's usually what, I mean, for the stuff that I buy, but I also have some Sigma stuff. And, and I said, again, my five micro four thirds is a lot of Zuko and, um, and the, and then the Panasonic motorized. Well, Olympus? Um, Olympus? Chris, uh, the Olympus ones. Yeah. The, the Olympus are the, the really high end, the really high end micro four thirds of the Olympus uh, lenses that I'm using. Um, uh, Yashai. You're still muted. For high lens, I highly recommend the 24, for, budge, good, for budget lens, 24 to 105 without saying Canon or whatever. Second lens, if you want to have a little more money because you usually have a better f-stop will be the 24 to 70. And if you want to go prime, just be ready to buy at least three because whatever you're going to buy, you're going to need the next one. So right. If you buy, <laughs> if you buy, and, if and you, get, you know, 
f-stop is important i mean i i, I generally will buy almost all of my lenses are 2.8 you yeah, know or, or you know that's that's i mean or faster you yeah, know so but 70 will do the trick yeah neil you were gonna say something then we're gonna move on Actually, I was literally about to say exactly what you said. If you're going okay. to start spending money on a set of primes, you need to, I, I always make sure that I'm going to at least get something two weight or wider. Yeah. Or, Jim, Jim, did you have any, yeah. any, any, did you have any two cents on this? Uh, oh, you're, you're muted. I, I just think that if you're going to buy zooms, you need to think of them as variable primes. So high end for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, check for, for breathing and some of those, like the 24 to 105, they say they're F4 all the way through, but when you get to the long end of the lens, they start to drop off. So just do your research. I mean, the, it's just, you know, it's, it, there's just so many variables nowadays. And, and the other thing to know is that, you know, know your lens, research the lens that you buy, know the thing that, like, for instance, the sharpest part of the lens is typically somewhere between 5.6 and 8. So, you know, you know, so you, you want to think about like, it's not, they're, they're not equal all the way through. I mean, obviously the more expensive ones get more equal, um, but they're going to have, they're, you're going to get, you're going to change sharpness, especially, you know, um, as you, you know, uh, change your aperture, your sharpness is going to change. Um, as you change your focus, obviously your sharpness, your, your, um, uh, light sensitivity, and everything else contained. So there's a lot of things that, you, and you just want to, some of it just doing a lot of it, but there's a lot of that data online as well. So if you're going to get a lens, a lot of people have gone through the trouble of testing it for you and uh, reading about that lens and really understanding. It doesn't mean you shouldn't get it. It just means you just need to know where its limits are. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and just adaptable. Anyway, so adaptable I'm going to now. Cameras. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. And now what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, one last, one last question, Chris, and then we're going to move on. Oh boy, the next one is kind of long. Uh, does Alex ever sleep? Here's a good one. At Philip Nelson asked, "Does Alex ever sleep? I know how busy he is. How does he have the energy to produce his shows?" Uh, I, I I don't sleep very much. That's the key. It really, you know, like you know, I I sleep when I I sleep as much as I need to. I don't use an alarm that much. I actually I usually just wake up. So I don't. I naturally don't sleep a lot. Um. So I. Uh, it's not that I never sleep, but I I don't sleep as frequently as at least the rest of my family. I don't have a comparison. Um, you know, I, I also, I can be very focused, so I don't spend a lot of time on, I'm very fortunate to have a, uh, a wife that manages an enormous amount of the details of, of the house and everything else. She, we both work, but she's the one that she, she insists on managing all the bills and all the other things. And so that, that's a part of my life I don't really deal with. And then I don't, you know, you keep a lot of things out. I don't have very many clothes. I don't have very many, like I do what I do. I try to keep everything else. I try to minimize everything that doesn't have, that's not m mission critical in my life. So if it's not mission critical, I tend to get rid of it pretty quickly. And so things take too long to do something. I I'm like, okay, that, that, that shouldn't exist here anymore. Um, and so, so anyway, so that's, I think that the biggest thing I'm always amazed at how much people spend time on that they don't enjoy and that are not efficient. Like I, I, I definitely spend time on things. I make, you know, I like to cook, so I cook and I do those things and I like to get better at them and I like to, you know, work on those things, but I don't, um, if I don't like it, I try to figure out how to make it faster and take less time as fast as possible so that I, you know, if it's not something that's fulfilling me, like, how do I, how do I make this not part of what I have to do every day? <laughs> so, so that's usually my, my kind of focus is to, is to try to minimize, minimize uh, inefficiencies. Uh, it's more, the, it's, it's more that than sleeping. Um, anyway, uh, and this is my favorite thing to do. So that's why I'm here three hours a day. <laughs> so, so then I just have to make the rest of my life move faster. So it's, it, uh, it, it, it works. So, so just, just a quick note, we we're skipping over 11 questions. If they're important, bring them back tomorrow. And okay, yeah, right, bring them back tomorrow. On. Yeah, we're going to move on. Um, we're, we're, we skipped over some questions. It's important. What, what that really, uh, um, and what that really tells us, though, is that is that you really want to start voting on questions and also get in early and get those questions in and, um, you know, but move those questions up to the top because we're now getting to a size where we can't really we're not going to get to all the questions every time. And um, and so there's nothing wrong with asking them again the next day uh, and then get them in early so that they get more votes. And if you like them, then vote on them. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Maybe somebody could volunteer to take dismissed questions to discord somehow no no if, if if you don't don't do that um if you uh if you asked it here and didn't get answered then just ask it again as yourself in discord but what i, what I don't want to do is have us get into the habit of moving questions around it's just just ask them again tomorrow here or or ask them in in uh 
uh, and ask them in Discord, and then we'll we'll go from there. But the uh, yeah, I like that. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, we're gonna shift gears. Uh, uh, Mickey, I'm gonna have Killing you go ahead, 